Hi, I'm Jeffrey, and welcome back to Night Falls. Come, settle in for tonight's calming meditation and soothing bedtime story. As always, don't worry if you fall asleep before the end. You can drift off whenever you're ready. Here, take a seat beside the fire, and let me tell you of Nightfall's magical origins. I've been fortunate enough to travel the world far and wide, but Nightfall's has always struck me as the most bountiful and abundant place I've seen. Tonight, I'd like to tell you how what was once but a small, swampish clearing became the bountiful and abundant nightfalls I know today. I'd like to tell you Anwen's story of how the magic came to flow over these cliff tops and into nightfalls. Before we begin to uncover the magical mystery that set nightfalls in motion, let's take a moment to relax. Start by stretching out your arms and legs, gently easing into the muscles, however feels best for you. Stretch into the muscles of your back, and your shoulder blades, your feet and hands, your fingers and toes. When you're feeling ready, come to a comfortable position and feel your head and neck fall back into alignment. Enjoy this moment of stillness to yourself This is your time. There is nothing and no one to disturb the perfect peace of this moment as it washes through you and washes away the stress and strain of another long day. As you settle into that stillness, Feel the relentless forward motion that drives each day, draining from your body with each cycle of your breath. Center your attention on the sound of my voice as you draw a deep breath in, hold for a moment and release it, sighing out lazily. Inhaling once more, hold it for four, three, two, one, and exhale. Welcome each new breath deeper into your lungs as you breathe in and out. Inhale and exhale. Now, If you're feeling ready, let me tell you of the magic that flows into nightfalls as the gentle tide of your breath continues to flow gently in through your nose and out through your mouth. The sun blazed even brighter than usual in the clearing that day and the scent of the wild flowers laid heavier on my senses because of it. By early evening, the grass looked a little longer than it had before, and the waters of the lake were warm enough to wade into without hesitation. As that afternoon trickled into another easy evening in nightfalls, began trying to tire Otto out 
as had become our ritual. I was playing fetch with him on the beach, and my good friend Danwin, who made her home in the depths of the lake, lounged idly in its shallows, chatting to me as the schnauzer bounded in and out of the water in pursuit of his tennis ball. If I recall correctly, it was Anwen who said she felt sure that the water seemed bluer than usual. And I didn't dare disagree with her, for even then when I had yet to fully understand who she is and how she came to be, I doubted that anybody had ever known the waters of the lake better than her. In the months I had passed at the foot of the falls, Anwin and I had stumbled into a rather comfortable companionship, and although we scarcely agreed on matters pertaining to the clearing, our friendship was an easy one. In fact, I think perhaps it was her sense of conviction that I liked most about her. Anwen could always be trusted to say exactly what she meant, exactly how she meant it. And though on occasion her words were a little blunted, her candor was almost reassuring. Anwen didn't appear to be all that much older than me, but a wisdom that preceded the smooth planes of her face carried in her voice and gave weight to her every word. I tossed the tennis ball into the shallows of the lake for Otto and he bounded in after it with abandon. A far more confident swimmer by then than he was when I first found him in the clearing. Otto paddled his little legs behind him and stretched out his paws as far as he could. Anwen lounged in the shallows, soaking in the last of the sun. I noted that it was the nearest to land I'd ever seen her, and as she relaxed upon the sandy bottom of the lake, I realized that perhaps I'd been wrong to assume she was tied to the lake, from where I was sitting on the beach, it looked very much like Anwen could have waded out of the water and made a life for herself on the land whenever she wanted to. It simply didn't appeal to her. When Otto's energy began to wane, he rambled back up the beach, dropped the ball into the sand for a final time, and shook his fur out at my feet, splattering me with the cool water before settling himself in for the night upon my toes. I'm not sure at what point our conversation turned to the topic of the magic that flowed over the falls, but I think enough time had passed that Otto was deep in slumber before I had even thought to ask Anwin about it. I'm quite sure that it was for Otto's sake that we kept our voices low, keen to let the dogs sleep go undisturbed. Not because we didn't want the magic overhearing us. The magic was always listening. That much I had grown accustomed to by then. At times, it even made efforts to communicate and play games with us. I got the sense that the magic rather liked me, or at the very least didn't mind my being here and borrowing it from time to time. So I was quite sure that it wouldn't have minded me asking Anwen about why it had made its home in the clearing.
I'd come to think of myself as something of an expert on the magic that flowed over the falls. For I'd been sleeping upon the beach before that waterfall for some time by then. I was unaware, however, that Anwin had been forged in the very magic that flowed over the cliff top into night falls, and so knew a great deal more than I did about the character of the magic that had bedded itself into the earth that night falls grew upon. Though I considered her a friend by that point, there was much about Anwin that remained a mystery to me. I knew little of her home beneath the surface of the lake. I'd never seen it, nor had she spoken of it to me. And I certainly didn't want to pry. So I asked her a question I hope might not be deemed quite so intrusive. I asked her if she had ever been told how the magic could come into existence in nightfalls, or if indeed it remained as much of a mystery to her as it did to me. The corners of her mouth lifted into an easy smile, and she sat up on her elbows a little higher to tell me her tale. The sun had already sunk low in the sky, and the ambers of sunset were beginning to flood the clearing. Everything the sunlight touched seemed to turn to gold, inclusive of the sand that I myself was sprawled out upon. I was hopeful we would have enough time to hear her story through to its end, before the stars stitched themselves back into the night sky and sleep crept into the corners of my thoughts. The story starts up there, Anwin began, pointing a finger at the deepening darkness of the night sky above us. She told me that it must have been centuries ago that all the business with the magic began although she couldn't tell me precisely how many years had passed. For in her younger years, she didn't realise that she really ought to have been keeping count. Anwen told me that the night sky had remained almost exactly the same as it was that fateful night, even after all the time that had passed since then. Her eyes grew glassy and glazed over as her mind drifted from her body. From that moment with me upon the beach, her thoughts disappeared back down the passage of time and she lost herself in the forgotten twists and turns of the past. She remarked in passing that in all the time since her story took place, a few stars had been blotted out of the night sky, and others had made it their business to burn a little brighter and make a show of their final hour. But, those fleeting stars aside, the unchanged sky had been the only constant in her life the blanket of night, a great source of comfort to her. She told me that it all began when a small comet started to sink through the Earth's atmosphere. Nothing particularly large or with any real weight to it. Just something other. A body of ancient material comprised of properties that had never been known to Earth. As that little space rock and the ancient ice and minerals bound within it drifted through the Earth's atmosphere, the rock started to blaze a bright white, with light flaring around it in great swathes, 
It looked almost angelic as it drifted towards Earth. It blazed so brightly that for a moment its beauty eclipsed that of all the stars combined. The rock was so small as it slipped from the night sky and down onto the Earth that its absence from the sky above would never have been noticed even by those with eyes capable of seeing beyond the borders of our solar system and peering into the galaxies beyond. I asked Anwen if she was one of those beings, if she saw the same things as I did when she looked up at the night sky, and her features softened enough to tell me that there were things about the world we live in that I might never be able to see as clearly as she could. Hammond told me that as that comet, small and pebble-like, came to settle upon our planet, the light that had flared off it dimmed for a moment. As she spoke, I could have sworn I saw a new light igniting behind her very eyes, one almost as bright as the light I had pictured, radiating off the comet. She was practically glowing, as she told me that it was in that moment that the magic truly began. For the comet had landed in the glacial source of the river that flows over the mountain ridge and cascades over the cliffs into nightfalls. As the ice within the little space rock melted into the water that ran off of the glacier, a white, silvering light shone through the water itself and began to dance upon its surface. As that ancient light flowed into the river, pouring all of the luminosity and energy in the universe into its waters, Silvering wisps of it began to jump from the water. The light rose from the river, like flames might, and danced upon its surface, like only fire could have. It was as though the moonlight itself smouldered upon the surface of the river as it flowed across mountain ridges and carried towards nightfalls. For all the light that danced upon the surface of the river that fated night, its waters ran no warmer. Where a true fire would have left ash in its wake, the moonlight that smouldered upon the surface of the river was balm-like and entrancing. It seemed to soothe all that it touched. The dried out, cracked up river bank began to soften once more as the fresh water flowed heavier over the mountain tops than it had in centuries. Fish began to flourish by the moonlight. The light that cut through the river in shards glinting off of their scales as they swam harder against the current than they had been able to in years. Little by little, life began to cram itself back into every corner of the clearing. Eventually, that healing light flowed into the lake of nightfalls, a wall of silver flames cascading over the cliff top. As the light swelled in the waters below, it began to lick over the boundary of the lake. All those centuries ago, the lake made for little more than a squattish, swampish affair. But, as the water trickled into the earth and soaked itself into grasslands that had known nothing but thirst and darkness for so many years, 
Night Falls was truly born. The earth drank long and deep from the lake, and the falls replenished its waters, flowing in abundance over the cliff top. And when paused to take a breath, turning her gaze to the falls, when she did finally speak again, a sense of nostalgia streaked her voice. It was around the time that the comet had finally burnt itself out and gifted the river everything it could. That I was forged, she murmured. I hadn't realised that Anwen was forged in that final flush of silvered water that drained over the falls. The water had begun to fizz with magic, and in the bubbling bliss of that moment, she experienced her first seconds on earth, flowing over the falls and into the cradle of the lake below. The water welcomed her by making way for her body, and as her head crested the surface of the water, and she drew her first breath, the ancient light began to ebb out of the water, some of it sinking beneath the surface of Anwin's skin, and some of it, like the great silvering swathes of light that had woven themselves between the pines, petered out of its own accord. Anwin rose a little from the water and realised that Wherever that light was from, it had been wholly restorative and appeared to have fortified the land. Wildflowers that had previously never been able to bloom in the cold at the foot of the valley began to spread their petals. The grass grew greener and thicker than it ever had before. And the waters of the lake which had formerly been a rather murky affair, ran crystal clear around her. Of course, she hadn't been there to see all of that for herself and confessed to me that many of the details in her story had come from the old man she found perched on a stool beside the lake that first night, fishing with his son. As her head rose above the surface of the water, she noticed him, fishing rod in hand, and the look of utter befuddlement plastered firmly upon his face. His expression couldn't have been more in contrast to the awe and wonder in his son's eyes as the little boy let go of his father's hand and scuttled down the beach towards her. There were several, baited seconds of silence as the young boy stared at her from beneath the brim of his hat. And finally, the older man reeled in his fishing rod, packed away his tackle box and tipped his top hat to her. Anwen said that his smile marked the beginning of a beautiful friendship and confessed that much of what she knew about the night she had come to be and indeed about the world beyond nightfalls she had learned from that fisherman and his son who visited the clearing weekly and talked to her of their adventures out in the world. Anwen felt quite sure it was the ice and minerals banded up in the comet that had allowed the clearing to flourish. For since that fated evening, come rain or shine, the grass has grown green, the bank of the river has never burst, and the pines have continued to stretch further 
into the sky. Sunlight seemed always to bless the clearing with the gentle heat of its rays. And in the time that had passed since that fated day, life had managed to cram itself into every corner of the clearing. From the butterflies with faith enough to take paws on the tip of Otto's nose, to the little yellow warbler birds that bathe their feathers in the cool sands of the beach before sunrise. The wild flowers in the clearing seem to bloom brighter every day, each one smelling sweeter than the last. Because of that little space rock, the grass is forever soft beneath my feet. The clearing bursts with colour, and the air tastes fresh with every deep breath I draw into my body. Anwen described herself to me as the essence of the falls that day. And though I couldn't quite comprehend her meaning at first, it seemed clear to me that she was so connected to the water that it flowed through her every word, splashed in her every breath, and rippled through her every movement. As I struggled to fully understand her meaning, Anwen suggested that I might very well find it difficult to understand her, being so bound to the essence of the water, for she had long suspected that I was the very essence of the earth. Anwen said she could sense that the essence of my being had long been bound up in the hallowed earth that nightfalls grows upon, and felt that I was as rooted into the earth here as the great pines that rise mile high into the summer sky. Her emotions seemed to stir more than I had seen them to before, and I felt honoured she trusted me enough to express herself so freely she told me that I had found ways to live off of the land around the clearing better than anyone she had ever known. She asked me if I felt grounded upon nightfall's hallowed soil, and I took pause to truly consider my answer. Despite all the difficulties that living off of such unkempt land presented, I realised that those challenges brought out the best in me. I found that I felt at home enough in nightfalls to think freely, feel deeply, and allow my creativity to lead me in ways I never could before. It suddenly seemed to me why I loved these mountains so much as a child. That sense of belonging, of being a part of something, has called me back to nightfalls and the surrounding foothills time and time again. If Anwen was right, and with her centuries of wisdom stored up within her, she usually was. There was a part of me, undeniably rooted in the soil here. It was Anwen's belief that the magic of the falls recognised something in me and drew me back to the clearing all those years after my first visit, for it knew that I truly belonged here. I recall feeling that same sense of belonging that she had waxed lyrical about, washing through my body. I had finally found the sense of comfort and belonging that I had always been searching for. A place where I would be fully accepted, 
and could learn to accept myself. I'd find the kind of comfort that people search for tirelessly. The nights I had lain awake, wondering when I might find my people and my place in the world, all faded into the background. The fear that filled those moments eclipsed by the beauty, love and security that filled the one beside the lake. The days I had spent worrying that I wasn't quite on the right path felt far off and forgettable as I realised that I had always been exactly where I was supposed to be. I came to understand that night that every minute of every hour, every circle the earth made around the sun had been leading me back to nightfalls. My home. I had arrived in nightfalls thinking that my time here would provide a few days of respite and be but another setting my story twisted through as I carried along my path in life. It was in learning to slow down in the clearing, however, that I realised the greatest joys in life are often granted to you in the twists and turns of your story, the bends in the path, and the parts of your journey that push you off of the beaten track and challenge you to chart a course through untrodden territory. I drew in a deep breath, and as I exhaled, I let go of the notion that there is some greater destination or purpose. In that moment I was happy. I was at peace and I was blissfully content to continue living off of the soil that sustained me so effortlessly, for I had nothing to prove, and no one to prove it to. Anwen asked me to close my eyes then, and encouraged me to listen beyond sound, and into sensation. Breath by breath, my mind became clearer, and my thoughts quieted enough for me to shift my focus outward, beyond the bounds of my body. I realised that I could feel not just the breeze that rustles the leaves on the trees as it swept across my skin but I could also feel the leaves being rustled, as though they were a part of me I'd simply never tuned into before that moment. I felt the pine trees stretching themselves into the sky, as though it were my own muscles exerting the effort. Somewhere within me, something divine and intuitive was awakening, for I could feel the first shoots of the seeds I planted in my allotment that morning, beginning to poke above the surface of the soil. I could sense the parts of the earth that were in need of a little more water and attention, as though its thirst were my own. I felt for the first time that I was not simply a passenger upon the earth, or in the clearing, but a vital part of that living, breathing organism that is nightfalls. As the realisation that I had found a home in nightfalls, a place to simply be, to belong, washed through me, so too did a deep sense of relaxation I could sense the petals of the wildflowers beginning to close as they prepared for an evening of rest. 
and allowed my own eyes to shut once more. Anwen retired to her home at the depths of the lake. And Otto too continued his slumber upon my toes. As I too drifted beyond the curtain of sleep.